On BBC One, Blue Peter. He's the first of his kind in Britain, but I wonder if you can guess what he's for. He's not going to be a slide in the children's playground, but he is going to go and live somewhere where he's going to give lots of pleasure to hundreds of children. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Goldie, calm down. <laughs> they won't have a, a crash landing like this because they'll be sliding down into water because this giant frog is going to be a swimming pool slide. A bit later on, he'll be hopping over to White City Pool, which is just behind Television Centre. But he's already had a lap of honour from Tooting to Fulham and a town hall reception. Great. I think it's a lot of fun, much more fun than the ordinary swimming pool side. And what's more, there's going to be a competition to give Super Frog a name, so it'll be interesting to see what he is eventually called. Now, if you were watching children's programmes 30 years ago, one of the treats in store for you on Saturdays was a programme called Whirly Gig. And I've got a Radio Times here, which goes all the way back to 1954, and you can see by the cover just how much the Radio Times has changed. Now, if I find the day in question, here we are, Saturday, March the 6th, you'll see that Whirly Gig was on at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, the symbol of the programme was this roundabout here, and it's a very special one indeed. It's a fifth scale model which took Mr Herbert Slack of Derbyshire nine years to make in his spare time. Mr Slack died three years ago at the great age of 87, but I'm delighted to say that his roundabout lives on, and what's more, it's here in the Blue Peter studio today. And I'm not surprised that when Mr Slack put his Derbyshire gallopers on public display in 1952 that they created a tremendous sensation. He won first prize with the Derbyshire gallopers at the Northern Association of Model Engineers and that is a well-deserved reward for all the hard work and loving care that he put into his roundabout. I'll stop it so you can have a closer look at it. Let me just see if I can slow it down. There you are. Wind the music down. There you are. All those beautiful horses gradually coming to a rest. Mr. Slack visited hundreds of fairgrounds throughout the country, and on his travel, he made hundreds of drawings of all the different fairgrounds he saw before he actually started work on his roundabout. And he went also to great pains to get as many authentic materials as he could, things like the cupids, which are on the organ. And if you look closely at these, you'll see that they've been beautifully painted as well by Mr. Slack, and he actually got these off some old Victorian photo frames. They're made of cast iron. As I say, he cleaned them up and painted them. The whole roundabout is full of mirrors, and if you look round here, you'll see that this mirror here is beveled, and that's typical of all the mirrors. And if I move the whole thing, you'll see that you get these marvellous reflections when the horses are going round of light and colour in the mirrors, which were specially made by local craftsmen. The three figures on the organ, you can see the one in the middle there, the grenadier, beating time to the music when it's going round. That was specially carved by Mr Slack, and the lady at his side is ringing a bell. Again, he carved that figure himself. But what about the horses themselves, the gallopers? Well, there are 30 of these all together. They're three abreast. And if you look at the horses, you'll see that the outside one here is larger than the one in the middle, which again is larger than the one on the inside. And that's exactly how the horses were on a full-scale roundabout. So you have the same perspective there, which Mr. Slack has very cleverly recreated. And again, they've been beautifully painted. A lot of fun round here is the whistle. I like this. Let's see if we can find the whistle. Yeah, give it a hoot. And just to give you one last look at it, I'll start it up again and uh, we'll get the horses going round. It really is a magical thing and you get the full atmosphere of the fairground with it. On April the 1st, the Derbyshire Gallopers are going to be on show at the Museum of Childhood. That's at Sudbury Hall in Derbyshire. And there's also great news for Blue Peter badge winners because if you go along wearing your badge, you get in absolutely free and don't have to pay the 25 pence admission charge. So be sure to take your badge with you when you go. 
Because we've been so successful in attracting birds to the Blue Peter Garden, which is due entirely to the efforts of the Bentworth School Bird Patrol, we're going to try an experiment. We want to actually try and get the birds to nest. So last week we put up some nesting boxes under the expert eye of the YOC's Peter Holden. How is it you've chosen this particular spot, Pete? Well, it's a quiet corner of the garden and that wall faces north, so it won't get too hot in the summer. It also faces away from the, the wind, which is going to bring the rain into the box, which will keep the young dry and, and hopefully fairly cool during the summer. Well, I've done the holes anyway, so I'll just put a couple of raw plugs in. There we go. Is it approved by the Young Ornithologist Club, this box? It's um, an ideal box from our point of view because it's got a gently sloping roof and it's also not too large, so they haven't got to take in too much nest material, yet it's not too small so they feel cramped. I'm so, ready for it. It's not too late in the year to put it up, though. Well, as long as it's up now before the end of March, there's a reasonable chance to be used this year. A couple of screws to go in. What uh, birds do you imagine will uh, come and nest in it? Well, if we leave it like it. that, it's likely to be blue tits. And I'm going to suggest, Peter, you take out that pla uh, the plate on the front of the box. Take well, that out. That's, that's it. it. That's loose. And that now makes it a box which is suitable for pied wagtails. Do you know, the bird patrol hasn't had any spotted any pied wagtails at all. I'm surprised. There are a few around, and it's just possible that a box like that might attract them into the garden to breed this summer. Well, I hope so. There we go. What do you think, Perth? Oh, that looks good. A nice sheltered position for them. Should do well up there, I Well, think. yes, they, uh, when they make their own nests, they choose a nice place where it's sheltered and quiet, don't they? Whenever they can, yeah. They I would rush down and help me in the garden, Perth. Unfortunately, I've got to finish screwing <coughs> this up. We've got a couple more over there. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, see you. Anyway, we've got plenty of work in the greenhouse. Oh, good. Let's get on with it, Percy. I'm pleased to see that the geraniums have come through all right. <coughs> They've uh, survived well in the Blue Peter office, haven't they, Percy? They've done very well, yes. You've kept those well, but they're a little bit mm. big and a bit straggly. You see these? Look, uh, Janet, if uh, they're those, if we leave them as they are, they get too big, too tall, so we cut them back at this time of the year, and we cut, if you like I'll to do that one, one yes. cut them right back here to a bud. As low as that? Yes, right down there. Seems a bit savage, doesn't it? It does. It's a real haircut, isn't it? <laughs> And then, yeah, we take them out of the pot, mm -hmm. and all the old compost we just shake off. It's quite tightly packed, isn't it? It is, isn't it? There's a nice bit of root in there. We're going to replace and this, then are we? And then put it back into the pot. Well, it's a bit cheaper than buying new plants, isn't oh, it? Oh, it is, it's... my word, yes. But a fresh coffee will enjoy that, you know. <laughs> And then lightly press it round, and now that's going to make a nice bushy plant instead of having one big and tall. And what happens to the cuttings? Ah, now those. Can I, we put those over there? You see, these shoots, we don't throw them away. They're nice young shoots. We cut one off like this, and then cut straight across, immediately below a leaf joint. Trim off that leaf there, and that one off as well, yeah. and these scales, and there's a nice little cutting. Now that we could put into a pot. In fact, all these tops we can put in. Put them in like this, press it in, uh, one, two, three, right in there, and then we'll have three young plants as New well as plants as, as well. Mm. That's ingenious. Well, I'll get on with those later. What else right. is there to do? Now, we can do the dahlia tubers first. Those ones starting into growth. You see there, look. There's the dahlia tuber. There's the stem. Place those eight onto compost like this. Yes. And now cover those with compost. When can they actually be planted out? You can't plant these eight until the end of May when the fear of frost is gone. That's it, enough to start those into growth. Put that aside. Oh, and then it's gladioli. Now, where the others were tubers, these are corns. See, there's the bottom, where the roots will grow from. When do these right. get planted out? These we can plant out in late April, early May. Cover those over, and those are soon going to start into growth. It does make you feel that spring might be on the way. Well, it is on the way. Only just round the corner, Janet. There we are. Is there anything we can be getting on with outside, Percy? Do you remember the lawn? We were talking about it last time. Rather a sorry sight. Yes, let's go and put that right, shall right. we? Do you remember what we looked at this last time when it was all trodden yes, down? Yes, this was a bit of a bear You see, patch. by the steps here, Janet, it gets an enormous amount of wear, pit yes, backwards and forwards, and then this gets hard and compacted. Mm. Now, if I give you a fork, Thank you. And one, what we do, we just stick the fork in like this. Oh, and then lift yes, it a bit. Yes, to let the air into the roots. 
That's it. And now, there's a rake for you. A good hard raking, and that'll keep you warm too. It's like combing his hair, isn't it? It is not. Just like combing hair, raking out the debris, loosening the surface. That's it. And now feeding. Just as long as you don't take a handful of that. Yeah, very thinly over down. the surface like this. That's it. Like not... a competition. See who's working the hardest. <laughs> ah. We're winning at the moment. There we are. And now we can look forward to a more like a green velvet carpet. Ah, you All promised that us that before. Oh, yes, yes, and I promise you again. Ah, let's hope we do have lots of success with those nest boxes and lure, lure some more birds into our garden. Feathered varieties, of course. Now, Peter Holden says, if you'd like to get a nest box leaflet like this one here, with instructions on how to build and where to site your box, you can get one by doing exactly what you did for the Jorvik Times, and that is writing your name and address on a piece of paper about this size and also enclosing a 12 and a half pence stamp and send all that lot off to this address, which is YOC the Lodge, Sandy, Bedfordshire. And do remember to put nest box in the top left-hand corner. Well, I defy even the keenest ornithologist to identify this egg. As you can see, though, it's covered in writing, and herein lies a clue to its origins, because it says here, gastropodically yours, Colin Baker, and there's a picture of a cat. This is indeed a gastropod egg, and gastropods are the latest Doctor Who aliens. And this egg could be yours if you can answer a simple ornithological question. Which migrant bird has the same name as a town in Kent and a tasty snack? OK, if you think you know what that bird is, send your answer on a postcard like this. And this time you put the bird's name is dot, 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 dot. And of course, on the other side, your name and address. And this is the address to send this to. Blue Peter, Gastropods Egg, BBC TV Centre, London, W12 8QT. And the closing date is... March the 29th. March yes, the 29th. That's Thursday. the address to send it to. And the first prize winner will get not only the egg, but this new single. There we are with Colin Baker on the photo. It's the latest Doctor Who single. And we're also going to send off 50 singles to the next 50 winners as well. And if you like spine-chilling tales of mysterious aliens, it is now time to fasten your seatbelts because Ultra Force 21 is here. Well, here is the producer, director, cameraman of that exciting piece of film, Tony Luke from Newcastle. Welcome, Hello. Tony. Tell me, how long have you been uh, making films? Well, seriously, for about uh, four years now. I've been interested in it since I was about seven. Something I must know straight away is how do you make the monsters move like that? Oh, there are quite a few methods. Uh, uh, puppetry is a good way. So it shows something, how you, how you do the puppetry. Well, this is Titanus, which was uh, built by my friends Chris Harp and Steve Donald. Yeah. And this one moves in real time puppetry as opposed to animation. I see. Now, if you yeah. had a sort of like a human form and you wanted them to speak, how would you get them to move? Well, this one is the Black Falcon, which is from the comic strip AC21, again Falcon. by my friends Graham Bassett and Graham Bleetham, yeah. and he has a flexible latex face. Oh, I see. Can I ask him a question? Yep. <laughs> is it hot in the studio? Yes, it's very hot. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. And what, what's another method? Uh, radio control is another way oh, of doing it. Oh, that's what this and, is for. Uh, the Mecha Titanus 3, though. That's that one. That's, That's Mecha Titanus. I'll see if I can get him to attack something else. That's good stuff, isn't there it? There he goes. <laughs> He's going backwards now. <laughs> <laughs> I could play with that all day. Yeah. And what's the, um, you said there was three. What's the third one? Stop frame animation. It's uh, the conventional way, the way they used to do King Kong. Uh, I've got one here. This is the animation Titanus. Yeah. Like that. And uh, basically what you do is to take one frame, that's one photograph along the strip of film, yeah. click it, click the camera, move again, click, move again, click. I and see. so when the film's yeah. projected at normal speed, it gives the illusion of movement. Yeah. And that's the same with they, they do more? That's right, mm. yes. How long would it take you to, say, do a minute of film like that? I'd say uh, one minute of pure animation, stop frame animation, would be about six hours. 
I'd say. It's a long time, isn't it? Mm. Now, you've got some rather stunning laser beam effects. How do you get those? Well, there are uh, three ways you can do it. You can backwind onto the film. You can actually scratch the film. That's scratch the emulsion off. And you can also use bulbs, actually, from the point of origin, like Cerberus here, which is loaded with a grain of wheat bulbs. OK. That's good. Explain the scratching. I don't quite understand that. Though. Well, you scratch the emulsion from the film itself, and bearing in mind that each frame of film is very small, it, it does tend to give you eye strain. So there's 18 it, pictures per second, so you've got to scratch all 18 of them? That's right, and it, mind you, it's worth it in the end. Yeah. It, it can be very effective indeed. Well, it's, it's great stuff. It's really, I think, a lot better than a lot of the stuff you see in the cinema <laughs> and on the telly. And I wish you, you all the best for the future, and thanks for right. coming on Blue Peter today. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure. Now, some of those uh, special effects with lasers that... Uh, uh, we've just been talking about. In a desperate attempt to wipe out uh, humanity, the evil aliens, the Zondralans, have set the planet Venus on a collision course with Earth. But with Ultra Force around to the rescue, all is not lost. <laughs> life story that is every bit as spine chilling. This Saturday, March the 24th, marks the 40th anniversary of one of the biggest mass escapes of all time. It happened during the Second World War when 76 Allied prisoners broke out of their Nazi prison camp, Stalag Luft III, using the longest tunnel ever made by prisoners of war. Their story was told in the film, The Great Escape, and also in this book, Escape to Danger, and it really is incredible to think that every single word of this story is true. One of the prisoners of war who helped to plan the escape was Flight Lieutenant Lee Kenyon. He was an artist, and he used to hold classes in drawing and painting to help the prisoners to pass the time, and he also made these pictures of what life was like in the camp. This one, for example, shows the prisoners filing through one of the entrances, being watched by the German guards. And here's a drawing of one of the prison huts, where the prisoners were kept behind high barbed wire fences. But the prisoners hated being cooped up behind barbed wire day after day, bored and hungry while the war was still going on. They determined to make a bid to escape. But escape seemed impossible. They were surrounded by barbed wire and watched all the time by guards. Searchlights swept across the ground at night, and there were even microphones buried to detect any tunnelling. Even if they managed to break camp, what would be the use? The camp was in Sargon in eastern Germany. Hundreds of miles of enemy territory cut them off from the sea coast, or from neutral Switzerland. Squadron leader Roger Bushell, a Spitfire squadron commander, said it was possible to escape. He called for volunteers and got hundreds, Air Force officers of all nationalities, this was going to be a great escape. They called him Mr. X, and they were Organization X. They began in one of the huts, moving a stove and a concrete block and digging down deep enough to avoid the buried microphones. A lookout, called a stooge, kept a constant watch. They could get the hut back to normal in two minutes flat. At the bottom, they hollowed out a workroom eight feet by four where they could make tools for digging, split boards from their beds to shore up the tunnel, and where exhausted diggers could rest after a shift on duty. A tin can filled with pebbles attached to the room overhead was rattled to give warning of any danger. Then, work on the real tunnel could get started. The men referred to it as Harry. Tom and Dick were earlier tunnels that hadn't worked. They planned its path carefully so that it would come out in a wood beyond the camp. They built a ventilation pump because there was no air in the hot, stifling tunnel. They made it out of empty dried milk tins and RAF kit bags. Day and night, digging went on under the noses of the German guards. Lee Kenyon went into the tunnel and made drawings of the men at work. They were cramped and hot and constantly in danger of the tunnel collapsing, as well as of being discovered. All the time, they dreamed of the moment when they would break free 
The greatest problem was getting rid of the earth they dug out. It was like soft white sand. They loaded trucks and took it to a sand dispersal chamber next to the underground workroom. Then they made bags called sausages, filled them with sand and wore them inside their trouser legs. They walked so strangely they called each other penguins. The bags had an opening so they could let the sand trickle out around the camp and then quickly trample it into the ground. They shifted hundreds of tons of sand like that until the topsoil of the camp began to change colour and all that went on for 15 incredible months. This is Lee Kenyon's plan of the camp showing the hut and the path of Tunnel Harry. It was 350 feet long, the longest tunnel ever dug by prisoners of war and 30 feet below the ground. Now it was meant to go under this German guard box here and come out in the wood beyond. But even if Tunnel Harry did work and the prisoners escaped, what could they do? How could they get across Germany to safety? Because Lee Kenyon held drawing classes, he was able to get hold of paper. So he was put in charge of the forged identity documents department. And he set to work making passports and railway tickets, as well as identity cards like this one. And his helpers even made date stamps cut from the rubber heels of their boots. All this time, of course, the men were getting very impatient, waiting to get out. And at last, a day was chosen. It was to be March the 24th, 1944. Zero hour was 9.30 at night. 160 men were to escape. So one by one, every few minutes, they crept into the tunnel towards the entrance. Then they had a ghastly shock. Instead of coming up in the woods, the tunnel was short. The men were in danger of coming out right under the eyes of the German guard. They had to time each man's escape as the guard moved away, and this slowed them down terribly. By daybreak, 76 men had managed to escape, and then a German sentry gave the alarm. They simply didn't have enough time, and only three of the 76 prisoners made it home safely, one to Holland and two to Norway. It must have been agony for the men waiting behind for information. And then they heard some dreadful news. 50 of the prisoners who'd attempted to escape were shot. When the war ended, their brothers put up a memorial to the officers who'd been shot, and it stands on the very site where Stalag III used to be. And Lee Kenyon made this drawing of the memorial to round off his story of the great escape. But there's more because the drawings themselves had an amazing escape. They were wrapped up and sealed in an airtight tin and then hidden in one of the abandoned escape tunnels called Dick. When the war was ended, they were recovered and taken back to England so that people could see what life had been like for the prisoners. And even more exciting, here in the studio today is the man who made those drawings, Flight Lieutenant Lee Kenyon. If it hadn't been for your forged papers, the prisoners wouldn't have stood a chance. Did you stay behind to help the others escape? Uh, well, no, I was, I was supposed to be going out, but my number didn't come up. I should just say that uh, although I was forging papers, the real boss of the forgery department was uh, uh, Tim Whalen, who mm -hmm. tragically died. He was one of the 50. Why was the tunnel 30 feet below ground? Why did you have to go so deep? Well, the Germans buried uh, microphones all around the camp underneath the wire. We stood and laughed at them while they were doing it. And uh, they were very sensitive. And we were quite certain we'd have to go 30 feet to get underneath them yeah. without blasting them off. Now, the film, The Great Escape, which was made with Steve McQueen, was very memorable. What did you think of it? Rubbish. <laughs> it was a travesty of the truth, really, most of it. Why very little bit. Well, they, they added so much into it. There were no Americans in the camp to start with, and Steve McQueen dashing around on a motorcycle was quite absurd. You couldn't, it couldn't have happened. I think the biggest uh, uh, travesty of all was when they showed the shooting at the end of it, because they were not... Uh, the 50 that were shot, they were not taken out and ruthlessly mowed down with machine guns. They were taken out individually in cars and told that they were being taken back to a prison camp. And uh, they were told they'd get out of the car, go and spend a penny behind a bush, and they were shot in the back. Oh, we I know see. that now. What was your worst moment in the prison camp? Well, the, when we were told, of course, that the 50 were shot because they were all great friends of ours, and it was a very great tragedy. But we had to wait six months before we heard anything at all. But I think uh, really the worst moment is the whole of the period of the time that you were there, because it's not nice being a prisoner of war at all. You don't, you're not well fed. We were hungry all the time. Yes. And you don't know what's going on at home. You think the Allies are going to lose the war, and you wonder what's going to happen to you at the end of it all. 
And of course the camp itself was a very miserable place. Well, we're still lucky, I think, that your drawings have survived to tell such an accurate story. And thank you so much for bringing them along today. Yes, yes thank you. These are lovely drawings. Hello, yes, lovely to meet you. We'll be back on Thursday. We'll have our skates on because we'll be with the stars of Starlight Express. And I'll be exploring a house where time has stood still for 200 years. So we'll see you on Thursday then. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> Well, with the help of this Blue Peter video cassette called Blue Peter Makes, you can learn how to make everything from a sledge to baked bean and dumpling soup. It's available from local video dealers, or if you'd like details of your nearest stockist, well, you can ring 01 -2 -2 -2 -2.